We'll open up your copy of God's Word this morning to the book of Malachi, Old Testament. Find Matthew, go left, and that's where you'll be. You know, this morning we've had the world's greatest object lesson of how one thing can make all the difference. One cable comes unplugged on the computer, it made all the difference in the world, didn't it? Wasn't Leon's fault, it just happened to come undone. So guess what? We'll be paying attention to that cable next time, won't we? You might think, well, are there other ways that one thing will make a difference? Well, everybody who showed up to enjoy some Friday Night Lights realized that, well, one position can make all the difference, and long snapping can make a huge difference. Ask any farmer, does a carter pin make a difference? Can a carter pin stop everything in its, in its place? It absolutely can. It seems so small, so insignificant, but man, it can bring all the machinery in the world to a great stop. And so, how can we apply that to our life? Well, God is the one that makes all the difference. Amen? I mean, and we, if we value Him and we pay attention, then our lives are certainly going to be blessed. But if we neglect Him... Well, it definitely goes the other way. We experience some difficulties. Our quote for the morning is from Bill Dedman, and he says, History is the best guide to the future. So history guides us to the future. Our history now will show us that we will check cables before we start service. And that will guide us to a smoother future. We're going to see that the words of Malachi are going to be the same way. That they are going to guide us to the future that we call today and can have an impact on our tomorrow. So let's have a moment of prayer, and then we'll jump into God's Word today. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this day. God, we thank you that your mercy is more. And God, I pray that as we look at your truth today, that we will listen and apply it to our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we are continuing this study that we've been on, on Malachi. You know, he is most famous for being, well, the last author of what we call the Old Testament. However, his words don't just deal with the past. Today, they are going to prompt us to love God. That same God who we just said needs to be our priority. That same God that we just said that we need to make sure is the focus for our life or things go awry or they don't work or they cause confusion. Well, Malachi understood all of those things. See, Malachi understood that Noah loved God after Eden because he was faithful to build a boat in a world that didn't even know what a boat was. Or why they even had need for a boat. But yet Noah was faithful and he did so. And he preached salvation to anyone that would listen. Because that boat project took a long time. All right? It wasn't just something that we slapped together in a weekend and said, okay, we're ready to go. He preached salvation to all. Now, no one listened. No one saved his family. But yet he was faithful. He showed his love for God. Malachi knew that Joshua and Caleb loved God during the Exodus because they stood faithful and gave a favorable report of the promised land while everybody else did not. They showed their love for God. Malachi was aware that Elijah's love for God during the time of empire as he stood against the evil of Ahab, of Jezebel, and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And then Malachi recognized the love of Daniel and his friends that they had for God during the time of exile as they refused to stop praying or bend the knee to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. It's the instances like these that Paul wrote the quote that we have been quoting for the last six weeks, that whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance, and through the encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope. And so sometimes life's tough. Sometimes life gets embarrassing. Sometimes we start to sweat. Sometimes, you know, our face gets red. But nonetheless, regardless of what's going on in life, whether it's our fault or the fault of others, Paul lets us know that what is written in the past is for our encouragement and that because of it, we can endure that we can make it through regardless of what is going on. And so let's listen to the words of Malachi then concerning the love of God this morning. So Malachi writes this in chapter 2, verse 1. Listen, you priest, this command is for you. 
And just in case they were uncertain about it, there's a big exclamation point at the end of it. It's for you. The temptation that we have is to kind of disassociate ourselves from these words because well, these are for the priest, right? But if you recall what we talked about last week, and if you don't, I will remind us, we got to remember that we too are called priests in Scripture, are we not? I mean, the Apostle Peter tells us that we are a chosen race, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we, as Jesus people, followers of Christ, we are what? Well, we are royal priests. And so while the priest of Malachi's day... Well, they chose to have wrong attitudes, and they were pretty strong. They chose to compromise. God said, do this, and well, they didn't do that. They chose to just go through the motions. We well, you know if I just get it done, it doesn't matter what my attitude is. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Then God's going to be okay with that. No. And there were some huge consequences to that. What we have to consider was that if this was written for these priests, and these priests responded this way, and now Scripture has told us that we too are priests, then it could it be that these words are written for us as well, that we need to take heed. They could be true of us even. And so my question for us to start out this morning is this, have you chosen to love God? That's where we need to kind of look at. Have you chosen to love God? Malachi adds this in verse 2. Listen to me and make up your minds to honor my name, says the Lord of hosts. I mean, that's pretty clear. That's pretty forceful. God's saying, listen to me. I mean, have you ever heard your mama tell you that? Listen to me. Yeah, I just said, uh, mm, okay, it's time to pay attention. Make up your minds. The prophet here is telling us that love requires listening. You know, we get two of them, right? I mean, the old adage, we got one of these and two of these, so maybe these are more important than this. All right? God's saying, listen. Use your ears. Listening to God begins with an interest. Are you interested at all in the things of God? That's where the listening kind of comes into. Have you ever been doing something and all of a sudden you picked up something with your ear and you go, ooh, I'm going to pay attention to that. Maybe you picked up a song at the supermarket. Maybe you're somewhere else in the house and something comes on the TV. You know, whatever it is, it's like, oh, okay. And so you have to realize that listening begins with an interest. It calls us to attention. Should I pay more attention to this? Should I divert what I'm doing so that I can go in and see what's going on? And so listening, it's this idea of interest, attention, and it moves us to a point of consideration. Are you going to consider now what has piqued your interest and what you've adjusted yourself to? Or are you going to give it any credence? All right? God's saying, listen this way to me. And so the prophet then tells us that love is a choice. Love requires this listening, but love is this choice. Making up your mind. Oh, man, that's a tough one, right? I mean, gentlemen, have you ever asked your bride, where would you like to eat today? And then, oh, I mean, yeah, I, this will get, because you know how that conversation goes, right? It's like, I don't know. I don't care. Whatever you want. And so the gentleman naively walks into that trap, right? And says, how about this? And no, I don't want that. But you just said whatever I wanted, but not that. And so <laughs> then you step further into it and you start naming off two or three or four different places, right? Only to get, nope, I don't think so. Or you, you know what I'm saying? Make up your mind. Now, sometimes guys, we are guilty of that as well. But nonetheless, God says, make up your mind. What does that mean? That means to fix something into place. All right? Think of it as that Carter pin for your favorite piece of tractor equipment. You fix it in place so that whatever it's supposed to be holding in place doesn't come out of place, right? You are to make it a part of you. So when God says, listen and make up your mind, he's saying, pay attention to what I'm saying. Make it a part of who you are and so that it can never be separated. All right? That's an important thing for us to understand. 
So, if you have chosen to love God, then you will pay attention to what he says, and you will make his ways a part of your life. And so the question then is, are you paying attention to what he says, and have you made the truth of God's word a permanent, forever part of your life? Because that's what he's calling us today, and that shows whether or not we've chosen to love God. Now, for those of us who are more inclined to a little bit of stubbornness, I mean, that might be you, I mean, it's, it's been me and before, who maybe who don't see the need to listen, right? Like, I've got this figured out. I don't need to listen to this because I know what I'm going to do. Or maybe you just waver a little bit in your commitment. It's okay, God's going to understand. He tells me to do this, but as long as I'm kind of doing that, I'm kind of okay. Well, this is what Malachi adds to that. He says, listen and make up your mind, or I will bring a terrible curse upon you. I will curse even the blessings that you receive. Indeed, I have already cursed them because you have not taken my warning to heart. Now, that curse might sound awful, but what God, what's God been doing? He's been warning us. He's been pleading to us in love. Verse 3, I will punish your descendants and I will splatter your faces with the manure from your festival sacrifices. And then I will throw you on the manure pile. Then at last you will know it is I who has sent you this warning so that my covenant with the Levites can continue, says the Lord of hosts. So, if you have chosen not to love God, what are we learning? Well, then you will face curses and your wrongs are going to be revealed. And, and God gets pretty graphic in how he chooses to describe that to us. See, the prophet tells us that not loving God is terrible. I mean, we got to really let that sink in because we think about love as just being, you know, warm and fuzzy. Man, it is. But not having that warm and fuzzy is pretty awful, isn't it? You ever had your heart broken by some other person? All right? Not loving God is terrible. It brings about curses that, well, they're the result of your own choices. Because these things are going to be brought upon you. They're going to be brought upon the good things that you have. So it's not just those curses are going to happen to me, but it's going to come to the blessings, the good stuff that I have. But not just that. These curses are going to come upon the very things that I choose to do, interact with, and be a part of. That's pretty complete, isn't it? I don't like that. This idea of cursing, it stinks. I don't want that to be a part of me. But see, God is not evil to allow or to bring curses upon us. Sometimes we think that. How could a loving God... You ever heard someone ask you that question? How could a loving God blank? Well, we've got to ask ourselves, what is a loving God doing in this particular case? See, God lets us know that these actions are always the result of our choices. So, did a loving God bring the curses upon our life? Well, no, we chose to bring the loving, these curses upon us. God's been warning us in love, and we've been saying, uh, no, thank you. I've got this, right? And so, Moses illustrates this for us. The words of Moses to the people of Israel, just prior to them entering into the promised land, he says this in the book of Deuteronomy. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him. So he's telling us, you have life and death before you, blessings and curses, and you get to choose. Is there anything more American than choosing, right? I mean, November's coming and we're going to choose. I mean, it's, it's written into the Constitution, right? And so here, God's saying, choose. You can love him. You can obey him. You can hold fast to him. Blessings. Or you can do the opposite of all that and end up with cursings. Now, 
God instructs Moses to visually demonstrate this too. See, I love the Bible. The Bible is just chock full of awesome stuff. For those of us who are auditory and can just hear it and get it, man, Moses tells us. But then some of you, some of you are experiential kind of learners, right? You learn by doing, you learn by seeing. And so God knows this. Why? Because he made you. And so after the people of Israel enter into the promised land, after they've crossed the Jordan, Moses takes the people into the northern part of Israel to the area of Shechem. And there he shows them the twin mountains of Gerizim and Ebla. All right? And this is what he is instructed by God to do. He says, I want six tribes to climb up Mount Gerizim. And then I want six tribes to climb up Mount Ebla. All right? And this is going to represent, guess what? The blessing and the curse. All right? And so he wanted the people to see they had a choice. Now think about this. Which mountain will you climb? You realize that there's effort in both of them, right? There's going to be sweat in both of them. Some of you might say, I'm just not athletic. I don't like the outside. I don't want to do these things. More than likely, these were taller than our big Mount Scott, you know, which just happens to be the shortest of all the big mountains, right? I mean, it's just like barely there. But the same effort it takes to bring the blessing into your life, this passage shows us is the same effort it's going to take to bring the curse into your life. And so which mountain are you going to climb today? Which mountain is going to be your focus? Which mountain are you going to possess? Woohoo! I'm at the top. Bring on the curses. Man, I hope that's not the one we pick. So your response determines what you will receive from the hand of God, his blessings or his curses. So why choose? Why choose something that is detestable? Something that's going to bring about destruction? Something that adds dread and doom. I mean, do you, did you wake up this morning and go, God, how are you going to smite me today? I'm just ready for some classic smiting in my life. Nobody wakes up and thinks things like that. We want today to be the best day. So the prophet then tells us that not loving God, man, it's noticeable. How noticeable? You're on the wrong mountain, right? You're either on the right mountain or you're the wrong mountain. It reveals the wrong that you have done, the wrong that you have thought. So the priest, they offered sacrifices for people, right? And you realize that those sacrifices resulted in the death of an animal, okay? We identified with it. We put our hand on it. You realize that those priests were, I guess, in, in some sense, we're kind of like a modern-day butcher. Because not only did they take the life of the animal, but then they had to prepare that animal. Because God said that some of that meat was to be roasted there, and it was to be a sacrifice to God. Some of that meat was the provision for the priest, and they actually ate that for their supper. Those of you, which I am not one of these folks, but those of you who have prepared your own kills, you know, during hunting season, know that there are obviously parts of the body that we keep to eat and that there are parts that well, we don't keep, right? And those can be kind of disgusting. And so part of the role of the priest was to take care of the entrails and the stuff that's contained in the entrails. And God had a very specific example of what was supposed to be done with it. That stuff was to be collected and was supposed to be taken out to the camp, outside the camp and burned in a fire as a sin offering. And so what Malachi is telling us very graphically here is he's saying that these priests have done stuff that's so corrupt, it's so wrong, it's so noticeable that God is going to take the excrement from that and he is going to throw it upon them and basically do what? Reveal their sin and reveal their shame so that everyone can see it. That's awful. Does God want to do that? No, he doesn't. Who chose to bring that upon themselves? They did. Their own sin's going to come upon them. And as like them, if we choose to neglect God, that's going to be noticeable on us too. So it not only impacts 
us, but it impacts our children as well. That's what the scripture told us. And since, and why is it that? It's because we don't prioritize the right behavior. And so when we don't prioritize what is right, those who watch us, evaluate us, and look to us to learn are going to then do what? Prioritize the exact same things that we are, right? Which is why that third and fourth generation gets picked on here. All right? It's not the idea that, they are not re- that they're receiving an unfair punishment. It's that they have been unfairly influenced. And so whose responsibility is that? Well, it's, it's mine to the best of my ability, right? To make sure that what my children learn from me points them to God and not away from him. And it's that way for you. It's that way with your own kids. But it's not just that way with our kids. It's that way with our society as well. So we have to ask ourselves, Christians, today, are we pointing people to or away from Jesus Christ? The priests were pointing people away. And man, we don't need to be that way. So, does your life then reveal a love for God? So if we have to choose, what's your choice going to reveal about you today? Let's look back at what Malachi writes starting in verse 5. The purpose of my covenant with the Levites was to bring life and peace. And that, God says, is what I gave them. This required reverence from them, and they greatly revered me, and they stood in awe of my name. They passed on to the people the truth of the instruction they received from me. They did not lie or cheat. They walked with me, living good and righteous lives, and they turned many from lives of sin. The words of a priest's lips should preserve knowledge of God. And people should go to him for instruction, for the priest is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you, priest, have left God's paths. Your instructions have caused many to stumble into sin. You have corrupted the covenant that I have made with the Levites, says the Lord of hosts. All right. The prophet tells us that love for God produces life and peace. And I hope that you can see that in your life. See, the priests knew life. They had received the gift of life providing salvation from death, from God, and they enjoyed life as a gift that was abundant and overflowing because of him. So life brings, love brings a life and brings uh, peace. These priests experienced peace. They had a sense of completeness because of their closeness to God. And they experienced safety and general welfare due to his provision. That's what our life's supposed to be showing. So does your life today produce, you know, does it produce life? Does it produce peace? I mean, is there that sense? Or what did he talk about the other option was? Does your life cause other people to stumble? These priests had discarded the gift of God. They had sought their own pleasure. They walked away from God. And as a result, others became weak. Many were tripped up by false truth, and scores were, heart, were hurt or brought to run. I mean, stumbling can happen in all those ways, right? It's kind of a sliding scale as you move yourself down. So, how do you make sure that your life reveals the love of God? I mean, that's kind of the positive that we want to take away from this, isn't it, right? Because everybody here is going to say, yeah, life and peace, I like that. Causing other people to stumble, nope, I don't want to be a part of it. Well, thankfully, Malachi tells us this. Malachi says that we must show that God is special to us. He said that by saying that they revered him. And so do you show everyone, not because you're putting on a show, but because it's a part of who you are, right? Because you fixed it and made it part of who you are. Do you show that God is special? That's how we demonstrate that we love him. Malachi said that we must regularly share the truth of God with others. The priest passed on the truth and instruction. And so the question is, are you doing that? Are you sharing the awesome, good knowledge of Jesus with other people? Does that mean you've got to get your Bible out and go a preacher on them? No, but I mean, are you talking the truth of God with other people? That's how we show we love him. Malachi said we must live lives built on the rightness of God. You know, he talked about living good and righteous lives. And so 
Is your life built on the absoluteness of God's word? There's lots of things that you can build your life on, right? I mean, lots of truth out there. But when it comes to the absolutes of life, is it God and then everything else? I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be. It is God in his truth alone. So when the Bible says this, that should be what? That's what settles it. Just it. That settles it. And you think, well, I don't know that I fully understand it. Well, if you love God, then you've got to make it your point to dig in and find out what it's talking about. So that when someone says, how can a loving God do blank, we can respond him by saying, well, the loving God's not doing that. We chose this. We're the ones making the mistake, right? And so we're able to give an account and show them that there's a misconception about who you believe God is. Let me talk to you about his awesome love. So we have to be able to do that. We must walk with God and interact with him. And so these priests, God said, walked with him. And so my, my challenge for you is, are you walking with God? Do you enjoy his presence? Is it awesome? Is it sweet? Now, I know there are some days where I learn a lot, and there are some days where I feel like, man, there's this barrier between me and him, and I don't know what it is, and I don't get as much out of my day as I want. But the thing is, is we keep that one foot in front of the other. That's what we're supposed to be doing, following him. We must be people who turn from sin and embrace the goodness of God. Now, I'm not in your head. I don't know what you're wrestling with. I'm not here to list off the top 10 sins of the people and see where you fall on that list. But the question is this, is your sin more important to you than God? I hope not. When given the opportunity to say, I love God, and I don't want this, I'm hoping you choose God. That's what the world needs to see. God and God alone. That way we don't stumble. That way we don't trip. That way we help other people. I mean, the scripture says to turn many lives from sin. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, do we do the saving? No, we don't do the saving. That's God. But I mean, how amazing is it to help somebody in their situation in life? Help someone change a tire. Man, that's great. Help somebody work through some problem. Be there to be supportive. To see someone realize that God is better than everything else that fails and to see someone say, I want Jesus like you have Jesus. Ah, oh, now that's priceless, right? That's what God calls us to be a part of. That's our role in life. That's why he left us here. If we don't live lives that reveal the love of God, then we will be despised, just like the priest Malachi has written about. And so we have to ask ourselves, in our culture, in our society, what is the church spoken of? Is it spoken of greatly or poorly? Do we have a good reputation or a bad are we despised? Are we despised just because people are sinners and rebelling against God and that's why? Or are we despised because, well, we look like the world, talk like the world, and act like the world, and so they hear our hollow words and think, well, how pathetic. Malachi writes these words of God in verse 9. So I have made you despised and humiliated in the eyes of all the people. Ah, that hurts. For you have not obeyed me, but have shown favoritism in the way that you carry out my instructions. Man, I don't want that to be said of me. You want that to be said of you? You want that to be said of the First Baptist Church? No, please God, no. So what? So we got to love God, right? So that we can be the priest that he has called us to be. See, we can either love God or not. And this is the way Jesus said it. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. No fence riding. Because let's be honest, we've all sat on a fence before, Right? It's comfortable for a while until it's not. And then it becomes really uncomfortable. 
And then you've got to pick a side, don't you? Which side of my fence am I going to get off on? And so today, do we be a people who chooses the blessings or the curses? To love God or to hate Him? I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. We're going to have a moment of invitation, a time where I want to invite you in the name of Jesus to respond to the truth that you've heard. This morning, do you want to listen and choose life and peace? Or do you want to keep on stumbling? I'm here to tell you, stumbling's not cool. You can know real life and real peace this morning. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. So today, if you don't know Jesus, if you are not saved, you can be. I want to encourage you to respond to the love of God this morning. If you need to be saved, come talk to me after I pray. I would love to tell you about the love of my Jesus. But this morning, you might be a believer. You might want life and peace. Maybe you're experiencing some of that life of being despised because you're choosing to stumble. Well, you don't have to be. Man, God doesn't want us to live that way. You know, you can choose to love God. You can choose to repent. Maybe you need to get involved. Well, guess what? You can get involved. Maybe you need to become a formal part of our church. Well, guess what? You can do that. If you need help, you have questions, you need prayer. Man, I'd, be, I'd love to be able to talk with you and pray with you. Whatever your need is in life right now, I want to help you love God. And I want to walk that path with you. So if you need help, come talk to me after I pray. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for today. We thank you for the truth from the past. And thank you for showing us how relevant it is to us today and for our future. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.